been done, I would love to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker at this evening's event about access to nature and wellbeing for all. It's a real honour to introduce Tony Juniper, who is chair of the official Nature Conservation Agency Natural England. And prior to taking up this role, he was the executive director for advocacy and campaigns at WWF UK and president of the Wildlife Trust. He was also special advisor for the Prince of Wales International Sustainability Unit, executive director at Friends of the Earth, which is where he actually knows uh, the network of wellbeing director Roger Higman from. Um, and he's the vice chair, he has been the vice chair of Friends of the Earth International. So a real pleasure, Tony, over to you for your talk. Oh, yeah, and I just remind you to unmute. Thank you. Um, Turn that unmuting off. Thank, thank you ever so much, Flo. Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here and to be able to share a, a few reflections uh, on this subject of, of well-being and nature. So one thing that, that is um, quite striking is how during these unusual times we've been living through that the connections between health and well-being and access to natural areas it has become something of a talking point. And I think for some commentators in the media, quite surprising that such a connection might exist. But if you think about it for just a second, it's not surprising at all. So humans like us first evolved on Earth about 200,000 years ago, initially in Africa. And then we've gradually spread across the entire planet. And for that 200, thousand years, 99.9% .9 of it, more or less, has been spent very close to nature. And it's only in the last 200 years or so that we've become a principally urbanized species, certainly in the Western countries, about 200 years ago, urbanization began in this country, and it's now spreading across the world. But for the virtual whole of humankind's prehistory, we were hunter gatherers, and then spent a period working in agricultural settings before becoming more urbanized as time went on. And so it's only a fleeting glimpse of human history that we have spent in cars, air conditioned, shopping malls, football stadiums and cinemas. And for the rest of the time, we have been very closely connected with the cycles that sustain life on this planet. And perhaps it's thereby no wonder that there's something very deep within us which connects with the rest of the natural world because we are the natural world. And as we sought to improve our comfort and survival really uh, in those harsh times of prehistory, uh, seeking to have sufficient food, shelter, to escape from predators, we did settle in towns and cities and that has brought us great advantages but at the same time, we lost something very, very valuable and very, very important. And for those of us who spend time thinking about nature and connecting with it, this is not something that is difficult to explain. But for the world around us and those that maybe take decisions that affect our connections with nature, it has been something of a, a research project to make these connections real, to understand them, to quantify them. And actually today, uh, this book arrived in the post, which I will read, Losing Eden by Lucy Jones, pulling together a lot of the science. This is one book amongst many now, which is laying out the evidence base to show how access to green areas, to natural areas, to wildlife rich areas are very good for our health and well-being. Obviously, it encourages us to take exercise. That's very good for physical health, uh, but more profound effects on our psychological well-being as a result of being exposed to running water, bird song, wind blowing in trees, open uh, vistas with grasslands and woodlands in a distant hillside. These things touch us at a very deep level and have really quite a profound impact upon us. And as I say, that has been quantified. And today you can see a very rich literature, not only observational, but also experimental evidence to show this very wide range of, of beneficial effects. <clears throat> so that now is something which we know to be good in inverted commas, and also something which has now taken on a whole new cultural momentum as a result of the restrictions that have come with COVID-19. And the fact that we can't go shopping or bowling alleys or cinemas, 
many of us for the first time or the first time in a long time walking outside and finding this to actually have a really very profound and beneficial effect. <clears throat> so what are we going to do about this? Well, one of the things we, we need to understand is that those benefits are not available to everybody. There are some real disparities coming through in the data that's being gathered about the extent to which people either do engage outside in activities which bring them close to nature. Uh, and this is partly a cultural element, it seems, but also a question of physical possibilities and the fact that people living next to a dual carriageway uh, with a shopping center on the far side of that and then another housing estate on the far side of that don't get to walk in beautiful wild open spaces and culturally many people are discouraged from going out uh, because it's not part of their heritage or their particular upbringing and in the data you can see and we've been collecting this information during lockdown and indeed before at Natural England and we've published this in various forms but we find a very big discrepancy uh, between people on higher incomes and lower incomes and white people and non-white people in terms of their access and their ability to enjoy these benefits and that obviously raises really very profound social questions as, as well as uh, access questions not least because we know that it's people with the worst social indicators people uh, suffering from stress uh, drug related problems living in uh, stressful household conditions those are the people who benefit most from access to natural areas but the people who have least access to it so there's a double whammy there in terms of people not being able to enjoy some of these opportunities and at the same time it's the people with the biggest need who are often less able so what are we going to do about this well at natural england the big project that sits at the heart of our work these days is the idea of a national nature recovery network and there's many reasons why we want to restore nature for the last 70 years my organization and its predecessors have been trying to hang on to little fragments of nature that remained uh, as, a, as a result of accident or which were protected long ago. These days we call them sites of special scientific interest. They're isolated, many of them are degraded, and simply they are not enough to do the job that we need to do to conserve nature, whether it be to catch carbon, to purify the air, to clean up rivers, to reduce flood risk, obviously to conserve wildlife, or indeed to provide for the needs of a largely urban population that will benefit if we can afford those, those benefits of, of access to the outdoors. So the Nature Recovery Network is about rebuilding nature, restoring a lot of what has gone. And if you look at that challenge through the prism of this question of health and well-being, then it raises big questions about where we might like to prioritize that effort. So in this country, we are lucky enough to have national parks. Uh, but for many of our citizens, these places are very distant. It's not a place you would go. You don't have the right Gore-Tex coat. Your family never went there. And in any event, you haven't got a car. So these places are not really accessible to you. So that nature recovery network, as well as being about rewilding and bringing back areas of, of truly uh, wilderness countryside uh, across England with many of the animals restored and those places being ecologically functioning again. Alongside that, we need to be targeting, uh, we would say, much of this effort to towns and cities and the edges of the towns and cities. And so we have a whole raft of, of new policies coming through at the moment, very welcome ones, um, a target to uh, put in 30,000 hectares of additional woodland every year uh, to be restoring different kinds of natural habitat, 500,000 hectares is the target in the 25 year environment plan. We have the new policy of um, environmental land management, which will be switching farming subsidies away from land management and into the delivery of public goods. So um, those benefits we get from a natural environment will be rewarded uh, through that new scheme rather than simply paying farmers to keep land uh, open for agriculture. So another big tool there, and then plus some of the new tools that will come with the environment bill which will include the idea of biodiversity net gain that is if you are going to have to build houses uh, to um, accommodate urban expansion and some parts of the country do seem to need that then there will be a requisite increase in biodiversity in order to compensate that so if you put all those tools together the habitat creation the woodlands the farm policy the net gain plus other pieces beside and say where would it be best to target some of that 
I think a very strong case can be made for this idea of, of wilding the green belt. So around many of our towns and cities, we have areas of, uh, of land which have remained open uh, during the post-war building boom years. The green belts have kept areas around the edges of many of our towns and cities open. Many of them these days, it's not very productive for agriculture. Some of it is uh, very low gate grade grazing land. And I would say that one of the things we might want to do as we look to the far side of the COVID pandemic is to be thinking about a national program of bringing that wilding agenda to recreate natural areas, beautiful places, rich in wildlife, close to people, including in the green belts, and then to be extending nature along the canals, along the river corridors, into the town centres and, and the city centres in ways where these kinds of beneficial effects from exposure to nature can be brought to literally millions of people. You won't have to be an expert with a Gore-Tex coat to go up to the top of the Peak District. You'll be able to see beautiful wildlife in, in a 10 minute walk from where you live. That's the vision, that's the idea. And of course, for those of us who are close to these environmental issues, looking at the health and well-being side of this, of course, it connects with a, another dimension, which is the fact that we live in an ecological emergency, described as a climate and nature emergency. And for many of our citizens, that doesn't mean a lot. And the reason it doesn't mean a lot is because they've never really had much experience of nature themselves. And so to be able to create that love and that affinity with nature is part of a far bigger scheme still, not only about improving public health with massive economic and social upsides and social equality upsides, but also laying the foundations for the big political changes that are needed in order to be able to resolve those twin emergencies of climate change and destruction of nature. So this is a very big thing that we're talking about in this conversation this evening, uh, this connection between nature and human well-being, and it goes beyond the individual to be about the national public health scene, and it goes even beyond the nation state to be about the global situation. But I'm enormously encouraged by the extent to which we are now as a country much more talking about connecting people with nature as a top priority. And certainly if you look at the Natural England strategy uh, for the current period, this is one of our key core themes to be connecting people with nature for all the reasons that I've said. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, really, really powerful to hear that um, summary of, uh, yeah, summary of the big issues that we're facing and the impact that nature connection can have on, you know, policy change and, and at the kind of well-being level. Um, yeah, there's a lovely um, option on Zoom uh, that you can give a kind of reaction. So at the bottom, on the bottom right of your screen, you might see a reactions button where you can give a little round of applause, because okay. I know it can feel funny to talk to a screen, but yeah. I can imagine that um, used to it. Are people <laughs> um, waving. But yeah, much appreciated everything you've shared, Tony. Yeah. And Tony is... Um, Staying for the duration of the event, so if you've got questions you'd like to pose to Tony, um, as my colleague Tracy said in the chat, do write them in the chat box with a cue or a question in the front and we'll be picking them out and posing those um, to Tony following our next presentations. So um, I, I, we've got a packed programme for you this evening, so following on from Tony's wonderful presentation, I'd like to introduce our next speaker before we move to some questions. Um, our next speaker is Sophie Forge, who's the Senior Campaigns Manager at Semble, and so Sophie runs the Backyard Nature Movement, which is really helping disadvantaged communities to connect to nature. Um, and this is really um, exciting to have Sophie joining us because this really speaks to some of the issues that Tony was just raising um, about access to nature. Um, and prior to being at Semble, Sophie spent 12 years in the marketing sector, but she decided that she really needed to have work with more purpose and spend more time supporting community action and, as she puts it, selling trees and not cars. <laughs> so, Sophie, lovely to have you here with us this evening. Really looking forward to hearing more about your work. Over to you. Thanks, Flo. And first of all, I want to say thanks very much to, to the Network of Wellbeing and to Eden Project for Communities for the opportunity to speak. Uh, what well, everything that Tony has covered is, a, is an excellent segue into the topics that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and as you rightly said, Flo, um, moving on to that connection to nature within local communities. Um, so I work for an organisation called Semble. Semble is an organisation who uh, promotes positive change from the grassroots up. And we do that in two different ways. One is around 
uh, resourcing and funding grassroots community groups and the other one is around nature-based movement campaigns one of which is backyard nature which i'll touch on today and one of which is outdoor classroom day which is also relevant to this discussion as well um, so as Flo introduced there, I used to work in marketing and I have to say that at this particular time I couldn't be happier to be working in this particular space. It seems so incredibly relevant and I'm sure it's a reason a lot of us are here today is to find out more about this connection to nature. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a few slides to share with you to keep myself on track. Uh, so hopefully this will work. Flo, can you just confirm I'm in? Yeah, great, thank you. So the project I work on predominantly at Semble, as mentioned, is Backyard Nature. And the premise of Backyard Nature is getting all children to spend more time outside and to enjoy protecting nature. And that all is really important because it's about inclusivity at all levels um, and about diversity as well. And one of the things that I've really realized about working on Backyard Nature that is the wrapper of it is that it's on the outside the environmental campaign. But as Tony touched on in what he introduced there, at its heart, it's about social inequality and social injustice and making sure that all of, all of us everywhere are getting the opportunity to connect with nature, no matter what that is. As part of the campaign, um, and in the middle of last year, actually just before the second lockdown, we were commissioned by uh, Clarion Futures, who are the charitable arm of Clarion Housing Association, to run a report on access to nature and some of the disadvantages in the, some of the communities that were at the heart of their work. And this statistic on the right hand side is from the National Children's Bureau, and it's a few years old now, but it's actually really relevant and still very valid, which is that communities in the areas of deprivation are nine times less likely to spend time outdoors or to connect with nature. And actually that second point is really relevant because some of those communities might have access to outdoor space, they might have community parks, um, they might have uh, estates that they're working on, they might have school grounds but actually having quality connection to nature within those spaces is something which they might not be able to experience because they don't have the tools to do it. And a lot of those barriers we found are financial. A lot of people don't have the time necessarily to spend connecting to nature. They might have multiple jobs. They might have shift work. They might be working in different areas of the city and no time to do so. They're also tied into safety and around lighting and antisocial behaviour and littering and it being an enjoyable place to spend time connecting to nature. And it's also tied into um, the Gore-Tex jackets, which Tony mentioned, appropriate clothing. And actually our sister campaign, Outdoor Classroom Day, has really highlighted that one of the biggest um, barriers to children accessing outdoor space is having the appropriate clothing. And it's a really big issue because it, it is, ties into that financial time problem as well. The very same communities are often underrepresented in environmental action as well. And as Tony touched on, the, the climate debate can for some people, although not all, and I'll, I'll come on to that in a second with backyard nature, but it can feel really distant and it can feel irrelevant, especially when you're dealing with food and fuel poverty. So it's really important to have that context and that reference when communicating to these communities around nature. And then there's also the danger, again, from Tony's point, that nature is becoming um, quite overwhelming. Um, it's a cultural momentum, which is really fantastic. But as with climate change and the climate crisis, it can feel very overwhelming in that individual actions aren't going to make a difference. But nature at the same time, and conversely, could be a really simple route into the conversation around the climate crisis, because it's something that's really noticeable is right on your doorstep and you can see the change happen in front of your eyes and it's not in a distant land, it's not, um, it's not in a different country, it's right in front of us. It is something we can see and experience and see the changes. So a little bit more background um, on backyard nature. Oh, actually, I'm just gonna flip back to that one. Um, one of the main things around that that we discovered within this report was around reframing nature. So I've talked about the space but also around the collaboration between people and organisations in communities. So we're working with community groups, with businesses and individuals together to be able to help connect people to nature. And I've got a case study on that in a second. Just quickly touching on Backyard Nature then, Backyard Nature is a campaign driven by uh, a group of environmentalists called Eco Emeralds who are there on the right hand side marching purposefully around the streets of Anfield in Liverpool and they absolutely are and they were driven by a desire to protect nature where they lived within their local community 
and they approached a business, Iceland Foods, to fund them to do that, to plant 10 million seeds across the country. And we managed to do it as a backyard nature campaign. We actually planted 15 million instead. So we upped their target by 50%. And from there, the backyard nature movement was born. And the basic premise of backyard nature is exactly what Tony kind of touched on, is making it simple and making it very accessible within where people live. And that comes culturally and economically as well. Everything in the campaign is based around really carefully collated resources and things that are really tangible that people can do. And it's driven by the Eco Emeralds and by 20 charitable partners that help us to do the activities. And we only include those that are really low or no cost, have really accessible materials and, and are very, very simple to complete. So a bug hotel for us is made out of a tin can, a seed ball is made out of newspaper and a bird feeder is made out of a slice of apple hung from a tree. It's not anything more complicated than that. And we encourage the Backyard Nature Guardians that sign up to the campaign to obviously share everything they do and inspire more people. One of the big partnerships that came out of Backyard Nature was um, some uh, projects and a pilot that we started last year with Clarion Futures. Again, this is uh, Clarion, part of Clarion Housing Association. And the pilot we re recently completed supports this need for simplifying nature action. What we did is we provided three different bits of support to the community groups that we worked with. One was around nature toolkits, so actually sending things out to community groups to take action where they live. So colouring in bug hotels, seed balls, and of course the badges, which kids love. It was giving out micro grants, so allow, uh, grants of up to £500 for community groups to take more action, having consulted with the children that they're trying to connect with nature, so that the children feel connected to the outputs that they're doing. And it was about providing remote support by us to them in terms of how they can connect children to nature, even in the Zoom world that we're all living in. What was really interesting within this pilot, and actually something we're now rolling out with a consortium of housing associations across the country, is that a lot of the groups had never done nature activities at all. They'd really felt that they didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the experience, and they didn't have the confidence to take action in nature. They felt that it was something bigger than them. So that felt like it was something that they needed academic experience or knowledge of species or knowing what all the plants were in order to do something. And when they realized that we that wasn't necessary and that they could take it down to quite a basic level, it made a huge difference to the children and the groups and the project leads in terms of engaging with nature where they live. It was a really interesting and informative uh, consultation experience to understand that actually there's a huge barrier in this idea of nature being massive and actually people taking it back to being a flower in a pavement can just be enough and noticing the things that are around you. The key advice to the groups and actually the key advice back to us from the groups was the same, which was make it really simple, make it really fun and make it really collaborative listen to what people want. And this ties into that cultural importance, making sure you're understanding where people are coming from and how they connect with nature themselves in order to provide the tools to help them further. One minute. So three, thanks, Flo. So there were three main points that came out of our research and came out of the work of Backyard Nature and with Clarion Futures. One is about accessing, is redefining nature making it a flower pot as much as it is a big park or a national park. It can be something as simple as that. Creating really simple actions and clear communication and making sure that there's true representation in the imagery and the language that you're using around nature. And investing in community action to help local community groups support children and young people. Those first steps are really important. Our bug hotels aren't going to survive the British winter, I'll admit that. But just colouring in something and starting that conversation around insects and the problem for insects is just as important as building something big and fancy. And that's it from me. Uh, so there's some links here. I'm, I'm sure Flo will send them around afterwards. And my email address is there as well for anyone to get in touch. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sophie. And again, inviting people to give a, a reaction, a round of applause, or however you would like to show your appreciation for Sophie um, sharing her talk. I thought that was um, a really um, powerful compliment to some of the issues that Tony raised in terms of kind of really bringing it down to the grassroots and, and showing some practical examples of um, 
yeah helping support people to uh, and young people to get access to nature and um, so thank you everyone for being so vibrant in the chat box as well and asking all of your questions um what we're going to do is have um a kind of questions um question and answer session now for about 10 minutes and then we're going to go on to our two remaining speakers for the evening and i'm going to hand over to my eden project communities colleague tracy robbins to um host and host the questions section <laughs> Thank you very much. And as you say, it's been a very busy chat and lots of questions. So I don't think we'll do justice to them all. And we've been busy trying to group them a bit, but we could maybe try to address them in the follow up emails. Um, so uh, Sally asked, um, so this is for either Sophie or Tony, how do we ensure everyone has access to nature? in our current situation, when we don't want to encourage people to travel out of their immediate, immediate locations? Well, I, I, th I think unfortunately for, for everybody, it, it's not possible right now, but it kind of just underlines the scale of, of what we need to try and do on the far side of this pandemic. And if, if you look at the guidance that, that's there from government, I mean, it's basically walking out of your front door and staying in the part of the town or the city or the neighborhood you live in and if you happen to live in a highly urbanized area with not much green space you're kind of stuck really literally and you know that's enormously stressful for people and you know something that needs to be registered at this time in order that we can do better on the far side you know that there are some uh, schemes that i've seen popping up some proposals that could make things better you know, should we ever find ourselves in a similar situation again, for example, uh, a shopping centre in Nottingham that the Wildlife Trust uh, is proposing is turned into a rewilding project. You know, the, 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 the retail space probably is not going to be needed in the future as was planned for in the mm. past. So what do you do with that space? And, mm. you know, fewer cars coming into town centres because of there being less commuting, thereby le leading to in the future potentially less car parking need could we be turning these places into pocket woodlands and pocket parks in cities and those are the kinds of things i think it would be good to explore on the far side of of the current crisis but unfortunately at the moment you know a lot of people are stuck you can't yeah. drive out to the national park and you've got to stay where you are even if you had a car you can't use it thank you so if you want to add to that yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Actually, we started, we did an innovation uh, workshop last week with the Housing Association, and one of the ideas that came up was pocket parks in car parking spaces, actually, and buying them out. And I think that's going to be a really strong idea going forward. And obviously, as, as you said, some of the urban centres are going to look very different off the, back of, mm. off the back of this, which might not be a bad thing after all. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of the individual and connection to nature, it the Nature Connection Index is, is really gaining momentum as a measure of, of connection and well-being in particular. And I think that can happen from something very small. It is, it is around actually a flower in a pavement might seem might not seem like very much as an example, but taking care of something individually at home or even as part of your street or as part of your community. And it can just be looking at the sky and noticing mm -hmm. the nature around you there. It's understanding your space within nature is really important part of that connection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is specifically around uh, Natural England. So Mita has asked, what projects are Natural England doing to make them more inclusive to BAME communities in economically deprived urban areas? And um, where can we all find out more about Natural England's programmes? Yeah. So, um, so the, 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 the short answer to the first part is, is that this is work in progress. And so We've just recently introduced uh, a program into Natural England called Connecting People with Nature. And the idea is that it's all people rather than the people we were talking to before who were ornithologists and lepidopterists and botanists and mycologists and piscologists and all of those people who uh, had a, a love and deep understanding of nature. For, for reasons that I expressed earlier, we've got to spread this and it's got to go right across our communities. And so this is something we're looking at, but we haven't got very far yet, but we are trying to build at least some understanding of how these things are. And so the work we're doing that I referred to earlier, that's revealing some of these big disparities, it will at least give us an evidence base upon which we can work 
and hopefully get resources from across government to be able to do some of these uh, the, these schemes because quite a lot of what we do um, it's kind of um, constrained by uh, the legal duties that we have uh, that are accumulated over various acts of parliament over many years and some of the things that we would like to do including what the question is referring to and reaching more people with a meaningful conservation offer that's not something that, that is at the core of what we've historically done. So this is something we're trying to move into, but it's gonna require government to back us more to be able to do that. Um, but it, we've got big ambitions and so we're on the case. Uh, in terms of where you can find out more, um, we, we do have a Twitter feed and stuff comes through there most days and you can get announcements from us. Oh, you've been muted, Tony. Oh, what happened? Uh, I, there I you go. Time? No, not just for a second. No. So, where, where did I get cut off, Tracy? Was it? Was it? It was your just after your Twitter feed, darling. Oh, okay, yeah. So the, the Twitter, you can you can find out what we're doing from there. Uh, we also have a, a website, which is a government website. So it's it's not as whizzy as um, you know many websites you may look at, uh, but the basics are there. So you can you can find us on .gov UK uh, gov .uk, Sorry. Uh, thank with, with the government website. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll make sure we'll put the links um, into Natural England's um, in the follow-up email. So make sure you read that riveting read. There'll be loads of information in there. The, the next question from Rebecca is um, quite an interesting one. So it says that not everyone's experience of nature has been pleasant. So what can we do to ensure that all people can build a positive personal experience and connection um, to nature in their lives? Even for those people who might have quite a traumatic experience in nature. Has anybody got any thoughts, Sophie or Joe? Sophie, on that Sophie one? might be better at that one. Uh, okay. Come on, I Sophie. I can give it a go. I think, I think it's a really valid point and it's something that needs to be recognised in the same way we're being inclusive in all other areas as well, is that people might be coming at nature with previous experience or previous conceptions or previous their own previous narrative. And I think that just needs to be explored and make sure that it's encompassed. When... Oh, you've got the same as me now. It wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was you know, I think, I think <laughs> it's when I admit somebody then it mutes everybody. So I'll try not to admit somebody, but people pop in and out. I'm sorry, Sophie, do continue. Okay. I think I think it's about recognising that. And actually, that's one of the tools we need to give to people who community groups or whoever it is who's connecting people to nature um, is to make sure that that is part of the process of reconnecting them to them in a positive way um, and seeing what that can build out. I don't have a more specific answer on that one, but I think it is just part of our collection around diversity. Yeah, it's a really interesting question, isn't it? And as you say, it's, it's one thing to bear in mind and keep mindful of. Um, I think there's um, always in every meeting I've had looking at the outdoors and nature, litter comes up. And, um, and uh, I don't know who it is, but Southampton Seed Swap asked, how do you get people to engage positively with outdoor urban areas to curb some of the adverse behaviours such as littering and encourage that pride of place um, that will increase well-being? Yeah, well, should, should, I, should I say a few words on that, Tracy? Please. Yeah, I think litter, it's quite interesting, isn't it? It's probably you know, the, 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 the environmental issue that affects most people directly, and yet it's one that we hardly ever talk about. So, and the, big, the big environment groups don't tend to focus on it, and ever since Keep Britain Tidy disappeared, or maybe it's still there, I don't see much from it anymore. It's not really something which, which gets a lot of airtime, and it should do, because it does blight places in really obvious ways. I mean, you know, even some toxic pollution that's in a river, you don't necessarily notice it, but a polythene bag or a plastic bottle, you do. And it's quite off-putting. It really does make places look quite ugly when they could look quite nice. And so getting some kind of new social norm on litter, I think probably is what it's about. I mean, for, for some people, it is socially acceptable because they do it. And obviously for themselves, it's acceptable, whether they do it in private and they don't let anyone else see that they're throwing things on the floor. It'd be interesting to research that and just to do some basic psychological understanding of what's going on there because once you've understood 
what the behavior is and what the psychology of it is, then you can start to think through what kind of messages, what kind of um, encouragement or deterrence would help people to not do it. We're just actually at the moment rewriting the countryside code at Natural England. And so this is a subject that's come back onto the list for us, uh, not least because of all the complaints that have come during the pandemic with people going out to so-called beauty spots and then leaving them considerably less beautiful by the time they come home when they've left their picnic behind and everything. So it's, um, it, it, it's, it, it's something which is also, you know, it's a kind of ladder issue. You know, you're not gonna get people to care about the ice caps melting if they don't care about chucking their coat tin in the canal. So there's kind of, there's, there's another kind of dimension to it there as well about kind of getting people on that kind of, you know, that, that more um, connected understanding of the world they live in because litter's gotta be the ultimate example of being utterly disconnected. There's just one thing I would add to that. Which, yeah, it's ab absolutely right. And one thing, one thing we've come up against with backyard nature is around permissions. Is that we want people don't necessarily. Well, we kind of do want a bit of an anarchic seed throwing, to be honest. <laughs> but that is kind of what we're about. But people do have an issue with permission. What can they do? What can't they do? And if they don't feel they have permission to look after a space, then they won't have that sense of ownership, which will which will keep it clean. And I think that that's something that can be addressed and, and could be addressed um, by working directly with communities to give, I hate to use the word empowerment, but to give them a framework or something which allows them to take permission of that land within a small space, um, rather than it being a, a big load of paperwork and red tape. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got a few more questions, but I'm really mindful of time flow. Shall I just do one more or shall we move on? I think that it would be great to move on to our next speakers and then Thank we you. a longer um, Q&A session after our next two speakers so that yeah. we bring them into the discussion as well. If that's okay. Fine. No, that's fine. I was trying to be very good and keep an eye on time. Thank you so much, Sophie. So thank you, Tony and, and uh, Sophie. And, and do stay on because yeah. we'll have some more questions. Um, and Tony and Sophie will join in in the second round of questions as well. But we do want to give um, enough time to hear from our second two speakers of the evening as well. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Rianne Fatanikan, who uh, works at Black Girls Hike UK. So Rianne is an award-winning outdoor advocate and she's actually the founder of Black Girls Hike UK, which is a non-profit organisation challenging the lack of representation and inclusion of people of colour in the outdoor community, whilst also providing a safe environment for black women to reconnect with nature. So really exciting um, that Rianne has joined us this evening and really looking forward to hearing more about your work, Rianne. Over to you. Hi, so thanks for having me. I feel like that bio was probably about half of my first paragraph that I was going to say, actually. So um, I'm the founder of Black Girls Hike, which is an organisation that I founded to increase representation and diversity in the outdoors and basically just to create a safe space for Black women to feel like they can explore and reconnect. I think everyone kind of is of the understanding that the outdoors is kind of seen as like this white middle class domain and um, mainly male as well so there's like a lot of barriers there that we're kind of hoping that we can overcome um, and I think Tony touched on absolutely most of them actually and um, so I think the one of the main ones that I've come across really is the is the skills a lot of people who don't have any exposure to the outdoors they don't have really the soft skills just to kind of know how to get outdoors there's also kind of like the cultural and the historic aspect of it. So if you think about when our parents and our grandparents were first coming over to the UK, obviously they were facing a lot of hostility in the cities. Um, and obviously the countryside was not necessarily somewhere that they felt like was welcoming to them. But then it's also the case of, you know, not everyone has always had the privilege of being able to have a hobby. Having a hobby and a pastime is a privilege that isn't afforded to everybody. So it's also that. Um, and then that also touches on kind of like the, the socio-economic aspects in terms of, if you think about the inner city areas and you think about the rural areas, I think when you think about where the rich live and where the poor live, I think it's kind of quite obvious where that is. Um, what else is it? 
Um, so what we're trying to do at the moment is basically try and overcome some of these barriers. Someone else touched on another of them, which um, was things like transport and access to the great outdoors. So when you think of the outdoors, most people think of the rural areas. I think everybody's idea of how they participate in the outdoors is different. But in this context, obviously, we are talking about the rural areas. And someone did mention that, you know, they do need, does need more infrastructure. And um, someone's just put, when I say, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to read in the questions, but I can see one. She said, what do I mean by soft skills being a barrier? I mean, things like knowing how to plan a walk, knowing how to read a map, you know, knowing what kit you need. And um, it's just things like that. If you didn't have any, maybe any outdoor provision in school, then it might not be something that you're equipped with. So I went to schools in really different areas. I went to a school in a really working class area and I went to a school in a really middle class area. And I noticed that when I went to school in a middle class area, we used to go on like conservation weekends where we do things like rebuilding like dry stone walls. And we kind of like had a bit more access to the outdoors. But when I went to a school that was kind of in more of a working class area, we didn't have those kind of like outdoor provisions and there wasn't that resource really. So I think that's one of the other things. It's not just a case of um, people themselves having the provisions. It's whether the provisions are provided for certain communities um, and I think that one of the, I think Sophie touched on something that was really interesting about how outdoor organisations can work with grassroots organisations such as ours to kind of help us engage more people with the outdoors. So we've just started working with mountain training so that we can deliver skills weekends. And that also ties into the lack of representation, because when you think of things like outdoor leadership, you know, there's, there's not many black or Asian people that are in those roles either. So what we're trying to do at the moment is kind of basically get people trained and qualified in that area. And um, we've also been working with the British Mountain Council. They've been helping us capacity build, raise awareness of, of our group. And um, Berghouse have been helping us with access to their network. They provide us with kit as well. So that removes another barrier. So people, we can lend things out to people when they come to, when they come to the groups. And we've also just started working with um, the Wildlife Trust and we've been doing some um, online Zooms. We recently did one called Nature on Your Doorstep, which is basically just kind of giving people different ideas of how they can connect with nature and showing them different examples of what actual nature is. So someone mentioned like a flower in the pavement. And I think that was one of the things that we actually featured in our Zoom, just to show that like nature is actually anywhere. Um, one of the things that I would kind of like to move, what I would kind of like to promote a bit with Black Girls Hike is kind of like the environmental aspect of us recreating in the outdoors. So I feel like once you're engaging more with nature, it promotes this kind of like environmental stewardship. And that's what I would really like people to focus on at the moment, because obviously it encourages like this sense of conservation. Um, and like I think it was Tony said that we're in, I wrote it down we're in an ecological emergency and obviously we've got the climate change as well and the destruction of nature. Climate change is also something that disproportionately affects black and brown communities. So it is really important that people are engaged so that they feel like, you know, this is something that they need to deal with as well. Um, what else? Sorry, so I had like a whole format of how I was gonna say it. And then when I was listening to everybody else, I was like, oh, that's really good, that's really good. Okay, so yeah, so one of the main things that I was also gonna say was, um, I think it was like what Tony said as well. And um, so it's about how we have moved so far away from our connection with nature. So if you think about like ancestrally, we are actually people of the earth. And like Tony said, we are the natural world, but we're so far removed from those kind of ancestral ways they had like all the knowledge and they knew the earth and they knew kind of like the rhythms of the earth and that's something that I would like us to kind of get back to so that people can really feel that reconnection because I think that that kind of reconnection would be like the most restorative um, and the most uplifting for people. Oh yeah and then my final note was that um nature basically just nurtures our well-being and it always has done but we need to get back to the point where we, we allow it to do it for us again.
Thank you so much, Rian. That's so brilliant to hear about the powerful work that you're doing at Black Girls Like UK. And I see all of the round of applause coming in um, on the reactions. Yeah, it's really, really inspiring to hear about the work that you're doing. And thank you for being here with us this evening and sharing. And such um, powerful reflections as well on what Sophie and Tony have shared to kind of build on their insights. So um, thanks. And I know that there's been um, questions coming in for you in the chat um, box. And we're going to go to our next speaker and then we'll be doing another round of questions for Rianne and our whole panel of speakers. Um, so for now I'll move on to introducing our next speaker but we'll come back to Rianne um, in the Q&A afterwards. Um, so to introduce our, our final speaker of the evening um, is Graham Duxbury. So Graham was appointed as Groundwork UK's Chief Executive in no, 2014. Um, oh, I'm just going to mute Rianne again. Um, and, um, and having served at a number of other roles in organisations, um, building national relationships and partnerships and generating income developing programmes and leading on policy and communication. So, yeah, it's really exciting work that he does at Groundwork UK. And he also has been um, awarded an OBE for services to communities and the environment in 2020. So it's really brilliant to have Graham here with us to share his uh, knowledge and experiences this evening. So over to you, Graham. Thanks very much, Flo. Uh, evening, everybody. Lovely to be here. Um, so I, I guess the first thing to say is that this is clearly an audience that understands only too well the benefits to be brought by access to nature. I don't think we need to go over that go over that ground. Uh, and uh, I think the speakers tonight have clearly articulated the fact that uh, those benefits are inequitably distributed uh, in our society. So I, I, I want to come back and, and, and reinforce the message about the fact that for most people, that access starts with nature on their doorstep or in their backyard, Sophie, either way. Uh, but the parks and the green spaces and the nature reserves that are close to home or on the edge of town. Uh, because if we're not able to make this first step, then a longer, a deeper journey of exploration and a, and a true connection with nature isn't going to happen for many people. Um, so not to go back over all of the evidence, but we know that people living in more disadvantaged areas suffer nature deprivation alongside the many other uh, inequalities they face. Uh, one in eight people have no garden and for black families, uh, that statistic is, is worse. Uh, that's because there's less green space within an easy walk and uh, people are less likely to visit the spaces that do exist due to uh, litter and fear of crime, as we've heard. Uh, and as Tony has said, uh, Natural England's data shows that COVID has exacerbated some of these systemic barriers, if you want to call them that. Although more people have been using parks, uh, as we've all seen, the gap between those who do and those who don't has actually widened uh, over the last 10 months. So poorer children, those from BME families have spent less time outdoors in lockdown than their white affluent counterparts. Um, so, so as well as being barriers in terms of uh, how much green space there is and, and, and where it is. Uh, for some people, as we know, the issues are around quality and safety. Um, so I th it, this is particularly, particularly an issue now for older people and people with a disability. Uh, they were already missing out, the data said, uh, but now that parks are busier, uh, they've become more off-putting for many people. But it's also interestingly true for, for young people and um, teenage girls in particular. So surveys by Girl Guiding have shown how important nature and the outdoors have been to young people's mental health during lockdown. But the prevalence of this drops quite steeply as the age increases. And, and that isn't surprising necessarily when you consider the provision available in most parks and green spaces for teenagers is predominantly skate parks or football pitches or multi-use games areas, which are seen as heavily geared towards boys. So it's quite interesting how this kind of inequity plays out in, in different groups across society. Uh, and then, as we've heard from Rianne and others, there, there are barriers in terms of relevance and cultural difference. So it's a, it's a pretty obvious statement, but we're saying that if you don't feel comfortable in your community, you won't feel comfortable in your local park. Uh, and for some, this is about feelings of safety, but for others, it's simply about who they see dominating the use of these spaces. Uh, and there are different conceptions of nature. 
um, uh, for, for example, you know, different cultures have different views on wildness. For some people, getting lost in the wilderness is a relief from the pressures of city life, but for uh, others who predominantly associate parks with social gatherings, it can be uh, genuinely quite frightening. So um, coming on to some answers uh, and, and some potential solutions to all of this, um, it, it, it's it's a basic fact um, uh, to say that you know one of the answers is of course better understanding and more engagement. Uh, the challenges were arriving at this realization precisely at the point when local authorities are seeing budgets for green space management at an all time low. So we've had a decade of austerity during which the typical parks budget has been cut by a quarter, much more so in disadvantaged areas where it has to compete with rapidly rising social care costs. Uh, and in the last 10 months, parks managers have had to cope with massively increased footfall while redeploying many of their staff for emergency relief work and losing the majority of their volunteer support. Um, so we all know that if the talk of a green recovery and plans for nature recovery are going to take off, we have to fix this problem and plug this gap between what green spaces can do for us in terms of health and well-being and the resources at our disposal to realise those benefits. So uh, some things we might do about this. Um, firstly, I think we, we do have to turn this into a genuine social justice conversation, provide more help for those who are excluded, give more thought to how we promote equity within this vital public service. It's, it's worth remembering that most of our urban green spaces are a product of industrial heritage and historic attitudes to leisure and recreation. And we, and we need to go on a journey of reimagining what and who our parks and green spaces are for, starting with planning and design, but also thinking about the way spaces are activated uh, and maintained. Uh, and one way of doing this is, is to uh, work to broaden our volunteer base. So getting more people out and active and feeling a sense of ownership about the spaces in their neighborhood means more people will feel comfortable going there. So turning more urban green spaces into community hubs the location and the setting for a wide range of activity and volunteering from food growing to sports to healthcare through social prescribing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but alongside that volunteer led effort, I think we also need to broaden out the number of professionals and agencies who are using parks and green spaces as the setting for their service delivery. So that means targeting those who are already dealing with social inequalities through their work, whether it's in health, education or employment and supporting them to integrate nature into their activity, whether that be early years provision or dementia care uh, uh, or everything in between. And then finally, my, my last point really is that, is that we need to change ourselves as an outdoors sector. Uh, so we often talk about certain sections of the population as being hard to reach. Uh, we know that what's more likely to be going on is that our organisations are hard to engage with for certain people. Uh, so we need to make room in this conversation for other voices, in particular those groups and organisations representing people with direct experience uh, of this inequity and find out from them what they actually want and need from us. Um, so like many social issues, COVID has brought the issue about who benefits from nature into sharp relief. And as we go through this national moment of reset, uh, this is one of those things that we don't want to see going back to normal. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, Graham. And again, inviting, uh, I already see spontaneous rounds of applause uh, in both reactions and uh, physical gestures. Um, so thank you so much for that um, comprehensive talk. And, uh, and thanks again, Rianne. Um, so this is really wonderful because um, now we've heard from our four um, speakers about uh, a kind of range of different perspectives, but all on this topic of access to nature and well-being for all. And now we have time for at least kind of 15 or 20 minutes of questions for the panel as a whole. Um, so Tony, Sophie, Rian, and Graham. Um, and also, I just um, before we go into the questions, I just want to um, share a reminder that this um, event is the launch of a series where we'll be exploring um, different aspects of nature and well-being in more depth so it's really wonderful to see such an active chat box tonight and so many people that are already really passionately involved in um, projects nature connection projects in their own communities um, our next event and we'll I'll, I'll mention again at the end and we'll share links in the follow-up email but our next event will be specifically focusing on how to support and nurture community 
um, nature connection projects. So if that's um, a particular area of interest to you, then do stay tuned and stay involved in this series. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Tracy again to uh, run our second round of questions. Oh, and the question fairies have had to be very, very busy. I think we could stay on here till 10 o'clock. Um, so I'm just going to sort of pick up um, and invite any of the speakers just to indicate if they want to respond to this. And I'm just going to start with Michael's question around that access to space. And just wondered if anybody had any reflections or ideas about how we deal the, with those contested spaces in parks where social issues such as drug, alcohol, misuse um, can be present. Don't all fight at once. I'll jump in if you want me to. Yes, please. Tracy, yes, contested spaces. Uh, so through our organisation, we've done a lot of work in contested spaces, including some of the most contested green spaces in Belfast, where uh, one park in particular uh, that I can think of had a peace wall, so-called peace wall, running all the way through it. Uh, and it took years of consultation with the community on either side of that peace wall to agree to put a gate uh, in the wall so that children could go from one part of the park to another part of the park. Uh, it's quite an extreme example, um, but the principle uh, applies to all such contested spaces that it's all about dialogue and conversation. It's all about finding out what the reason is for people feeling territorial or, or for the behaviours that are being exhibited in, in open spaces and, and, and trying to work that kind of collective agreement uh, about how areas can be designed and managed and supervised and so on. And there are lots of technical ways in which you can get into that. You know, you can think about zonal arrangements where there are different parts of a green space that are more suitable for certain types of activity and so on. But but there's the, 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 there's really no substitute for making our public spaces better populated. Uh, the kind of depopulation mm -hmm. of urban green spaces and the pub public realm in general uh, has been one of the biggest causes of those issues in, in communities. So, so the more that we can kind of reintroduce activities into those parks and green spaces, the more eyes and ears there are pretty much in those places, then the easier it is to address those issues. But you, but you really need to put alongside that the community engagement resources uh, that are going to enable that conversation and that dialogue to happen. We, we, we do lots of consultations with, with young people. And, and, and what's, what's really interesting is that most of the time uh, they're asking for some really basic stuff, places where they can sit and keep dry and where there are toilets that are clean and functioning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, the, you know, these are some really simple things that can be provided, but too often those simple things escape us. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question. So Alex has asked, how can we get more green space into new developments um, as the collaboration, but enabling developers to still make a profit, um, but to encourage a lot more green space? And does anybody have any good um, sort of examples of this being done locally or internationally? I look to our international crowd there. Um, but I wonder whether, Tony? Should, should, should I make, make a few remarks? I mean, Please. It, um, I, I think part of it is, is about awareness amongst the, the developers to start with. And, and so, you know, you see examples every now and again of things that you think, how can that really be happening, given what we know about, you know, the benefits of, of access to green space? And so a development turned up on Twitter the other day where the, where the developers have put in plastic hedges. Um, the, the benefit of this um, would be to um, I mean you didn't have to clip them and so somebody had this bright idea that you know a plastic hedge would be better th than a real one and so that kind of um, choice you know it, it, it just reveals a, a lack of understanding of what value is for the people who are going to live in those places and so I don't know you know whether there's something that can be done via uh, any federation of house builders in the country to start raising these issues amongst them so that they can start to blend this in. This is, this is not difficult. I mean, even planting native shrubs and trees uh, in ways that would attract native butterflies and birds, which would brighten people's days. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is just a, a simple choice that needs to be made at a stage when the development is, is being put together. And one would hope that there would be ways for the housing builders to be able to accommodate some of these things. And then, of course, as the local authorities um, under enormous pressure, they don't have the resources to engage 
very often in the way that would be you know most beneficial but nonetheless they could be doing more to insist on the places that are being built it's not just numbers of houses but quality communities that people are going to want to live in for decades and even centuries hence and so you know it's a combination i think of, of both ends of that we do have some policy coming through i mentioned this idea of biodiversity net gain which will require house builders in the future once the environment bill goes through to be increasing the amount of, of wildlife rich habitat than was there before the houses were built and you know this will hopefully encourage people to go further down that road but i think it really is just a, a basic lack of awareness and understanding is the biggest barrier to begin with mm -hmm. thank you thank you i think you're right so did you all come in there yeah i just wanted to to come in um, just to say that at Sandwell we've been approached by a number of different um, property uh, companies which is really encouraging around building out that community and community space in particular that Tony was referring to as well as green spaces it's fledgling I would say but it is something that with the biodiversity targets is starting to, to creep in um, and as I mentioned with Backyard Nature we're working with a number of different housing associations to make sure that even those small green spaces that were maybe created in estates that weren't ideal in the past um, can still be used to some effect whether it's curbside or roadside or, or balconies or, or whatever it might be so I think there might be a slight tide turning, but it's going to take some time. And, and as Tony, as you said, it has to be investment from those companies, not from local authorities. It's going to ha have to come from them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next question for Rianne. Um, quite a few people, especially uh, Joss and George, are very interested about whereabouts you are based and how do you operate and are you um, looking at um, setting up offshoots of groups in any different areas? Sorry which one was that for? That was for Rianne. For Rianne. So at the moment we have a group in Manchester, a group in the Midlands and a group in London and we've got quite a few new leaders so after lockdown we'll have groups in the North East, the South East and the South West. Um, and we mainly basically advertise everything on um, Eventbrite. At the moment, we're having to limit our numbers because of um, the Rona. Um, but usually before that, it was just anyone could just come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And again, we'll put links to that in the follow up email. Um, we've had a, a question sort of raised by a couple of people, Jocelyn and Mike. Um, have both noticed that primary school children are often the target for nature trips, gardening clubs, etc., where secondary schools aren't, as teenagers are viewed harder to engage. Do you think should, more should be done and more emphasis on teaching about climate and nature in the basics of um, healthy living in our education system? And that can go to anybody if you'd like to answer that. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in mm -hmm. and, and, and say uh, absolutely yes 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 more should be done um, so uh, education for sustainable development you know 15 20 years ago was was absolutely embedded uh, in the curriculum that's fallen away uh, over the last decade or so um, I, I think there is a genuine issue about uh, the disparity between engagement with the outdoors and nature in primary as opposed to secondary schools secondary schools as we know there's, there's kind of more more pressure on the academic side of the curriculum um, uh, w what I would like to see is, is getting uh, you know back into that campaign with Ofsted and government that says some of this stuff is absolutely of massive educational value it also helps build character it's preparation for life Life, uh, and it puts schools at the heart of their communities mm. so so the more pressure we can all put on that system to embrace uh, outdoor education engaging with nature as part of your kind of wider role preparing young people for life the better mm. thank you does anybody else want to add to that I think yeah, I'll just, I'll just yeah. add to that very quickly um it's interesting if you look at the nature connectedness map against age if there's a big dip at teenage level, whereas actually it goes up, it's quite high among young children and primary age children. And then there's this big dip as, as we all get distracted by teenage things, I guess. Um, 
Outdoor Classroom Day Artista campaign is one of the ones that looks at engaging kids of all ages through to nature, but definitely the engagement with, te with teachers is mostly around primary and that's the uptake. And I think it's, as to Graham's point, it's just because it's not embedded in the curriculum. There's a great organisation called Action for Conservation um, and they work on putting people into schools, particularly secondary schools, on filling that gap in terms of educating uh, young people on taking jobs in the environmental sector and also climate itself. So I'd recommend having a look at them as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, Rebecca and B have asked, um, and I really quite like this, um, are there creative ways to engage, to encourage engagement with nature? And if so, what's the best story of nature connection that you have all observed through your work? And as you're still up on the screen, Sophie, I'm going to put a nod to you first, if you want to go first. Through the work, um, I think the main one for me is around the Eco Emeralds, the inspiration for Backyard Nature. It might seem sound like an easy answer, but they had a school, there's a field next to their school in Anfield, which was completely decimated. It was used, it was used for drug users, it was full of litter, and that was their cat one of their many catalysts for how they could make change. And they wanted to turn it into a wildflower meadow. And that was where they wanted to plant all of their seeds. And to go from that little idea um, up to the campaign has just been massively inspiring and just goes to show that it can come from anywhere. And that's particularly a grassroots inspired story. So from, from a small flower came a big movement. Thank you. Would any of the other speakers like to um, pick up on that? The best story of nature connection you've observed? Um, I think a, a good one that the Wildlife Trust did was their 30 Days Wild initiative, which they run during June, uh, which is basically a social media campaign that encourages people uh, to do something wild every day for that midsummer month. And that seems to have been pretty successful, uh, not only from the numbers of people that they got involved, but also the feedback they've had about how much people enjoyed it and got benefit from it. So, yeah, the, 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 there's little examples dotted around of how this stuff can catch on. Lovely. Rianne, are you able to share? Oh, is Rianne still there? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just <laughs> literally just shaking my head saying I can't actually think of anything. <laughs> no good <Sorry>. examples. No. <laughs> Okay, well, I think your project is a good example. So maybe that's just too easy and too obvious for you to see. <laughs> Thank you. Graham, do you have an example? Um, I just like telling the story of Park Penalta for anybody that uh, knows South Wales, Caerphilly in particular. So uh, this, were, this is a country park, but it was a, a coal spoil heap. Uh, so we were involved in its regeneration probably about 20 years ago now, uh, and, and the story uh, just just really kind of blew me away, which which was that um, it, it was one of the last um, deep coal pits in that part of South Wales to close, and, and on the last day, the, uh, the, the, the miners ceremonially kind of marched out with their banners in, in front of them, uh, and following the regeneration into a country park, Due to consultation with with that mining community, there was a big grass amphitheatre created in the in the park in the shape of a pit pony. A pit pony is called Sultan. That was everybody's favourite pit pony. Uh, and on the day it opened, uh, some of those same miners marched ceremonially back into the country park, carrying their banners, and placed a lump of coal on the eye of the pit pony oh. just to mark its kind of regeneration and restoration. And it, for for me, it just typifies what you can achieve going from a blackened landscape, uh, a, a kind of symbol of industrial uh, dereliction and decay and turning that into a fabulous natural asset for that community to connect with nature on its doorstep. And it's a great place to visit now. That's fabulous. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, probably enough time for two or three more. I've identified my favourite last question. Um, but Suzanne has asked, um, often in Northern Ireland, it's hard to hook into programmes that are um, sort of UK or, or GB based. So how are your programmes engaging with 
um, the other nations, such as Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales, if of course you are. And as Graeme, you're still up, I'll start with groundwork, because I know you're in Northern Ireland. Yes, yes, fairly <laughs> straightforward for us. So so we've, we're a kind of federated movement, which means there is not one groundwork, there's 16 groundworks. Uh, I run one of them that's got a kind of UK wide remit. Mm -hmm. And my colleague Cara runs Groundwork Northern Ireland, which operates uh, across Northern Ireland, doing all of the stuff that we've been talking about tonight. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, do look them up, do get in touch, uh, and, and I'm sure there's, there's stuff that you could engage with there. Thank you. And I know, um, uh, Tony, there's Natural England. Is there um, equivalents in the nations? There are, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we have uh, counterpart agencies in the other countries of the UK. So Nature Scott, north of the border, Natural Resources Wales to the west, and then in Northern Ireland, uh, it's a slightly different structure, but we have the Department for the Environment and Rural Affairs as part of the Northern Ireland government. And so, you know, we're working through the devolved governments. And so our day-to-day -day contact is not huge, uh, but we are working together on a piece at the moment to feed into the uh, global treaty processes this year, United Nations treaty uh, discussions on climate change and biodiversity. And of course, um, the UK goes to those meetings. It's not England or Wales or Scotland mm. or Northern Ireland. So we're working together to come up with um, a vision of what nature recovery could look like across the UK in 2030. So just trying to inspire some level of ambition from our four separate governments as a collective whole, when we go and sit in the United Nations and say something must be done. And so to be able to back up our um, calls for global uh, progress by showing that we're doing it at home. So we're cooperating on that at the moment. That's a very exciting piece of work. And what we're hoping to do is to draw upon lots of the good examples that are already there. So people already, you know, rebuilding uh, ecosystems, rewilding projects, recovery of, of natural areas and their reconnection. And to show that, you know, this is possible and it can be done at scale and to feed that in to these discussions that will take place at the end of this year, one of which, of course, will host ourselves, uh, the climate change um, COP, uh, but the biodiversity treaty equally important in China just the month before. So we're doing some work there together, um, but we now operate under slightly different um, regimes um, because the environmental issues are basically devolved matters and so the countries choose their own uh, priorities and approaches, but it, it's, it's pretty comparable and more or less, um, you know, similar approaches that we're taking. Lovely, thank you. Uh, and Semble, uh, and we've already heard from Rianne that she's regionally based, and I think Rianne will agree that if anybody wants to set up um, a Black Girls Hike in the Nations, I'm sure she'd support them. Um, uh, and Semble, whereabouts are you, what area do you cover? So Sassemble is national, we cover all nations in terms of community groups that are signed up to the network. Um, we've got nearly 4,000 groups across the country signed up, so there should be plenty in, in different spots. Uh, Backyard Nature is also, of course, all nations. We actually ran a Welsh campaign at the end of last year, targeting Wales with some Welsh language resources and landing page on the website. Um, we'd be very keen to do more in Scotland and Northern Ireland as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really mindful of time, so I'm going to go um, to what I thought was a very good question from James. Um, and again, this is for you all. Um, so what do you think the chances of a national natural health service being set up are? Um, which I thought was um, really good. I know at Eden, we have Eden on prescription and someone mentioned social prescribing, but I think this is definitely a bit more um broader thinking i wonder what your thoughts on it are well, that, that, that's something I, I campaigned for i just got this off the shelf i remember writing this six years ago <laughs> and in here um I, I made the proposal that we divert one percent of the national health service budget into nature recovery especially around and in towns and cities on the grounds that we'd get far more benefit than we would by spending that on antidepressant drugs and blood pressure tablets uh, because we would get the benefit up front as it were and um, yeah still not quite there <laughs> but, um, one day hopefully we, we make a little more progress on these connections I do think actually 
that there is now a much more of an understanding, including in, in the health side. Actually, we have a really good piece of work we do at Natural England with um, Public Health England on social prescribing. So being able to uh, enable people to benefit from some of these opportunities, you know, suffering from, you know, anxiety, depression, some of these kinds of um, conditions that, that can in some part at least be treated by being outside and, and being able to benefit from those kinds of experiences. So it's beginning to catch on. Um, ideally, yes, it would be part of our national health, wouldn't it? And, and really baked into all of government, not even just the health service. Housing, uh, yeah, education, um, those two in particular, uh, even transport, you could say. Thank you, Tony. You've plugged two books today. Can you remind everybody there's lots of questions yeah. of which two you mentioned? Um, so there's Losing Eden by Lucy Jones. Thank which you. I'm just about to embark reading on. And um, this one I wrote um, called What Nature Does for Britain, um, which has oh. got, a, got a chapter in there about, about health. Lovely. Thank you very much. Does anybody else have any reflections on a uh, National Natural Health Service? Um, I, I, I just say that I don't think we need anyone to set it up for us. Um, I, I, I just think we need to say it already exists because mm. it's by mm. and large what most of us are doing at the moment. Yes, we could all do with uh, more airtime and more money and, and, uh, and more support, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but actually, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of the fact that, you know, before the NHS was actually set up in policy and in law, it was a movement of enlightened professionals and practitioners who all saw a need for this uh, mm -hmm. and, and started operating as if there was such a thing. And then the mm -hmm. connections were made between individual members of that movement and then government picked it up and ran with it and, 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 and legislated for it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I th it feels like we're in exactly that space at the moment, that there is this enormous movement of people who have twigged that this connection is one of the most fundamental ones for our society trying to do much more with it, uh, trying to convince uh, people that it needs to be absolutely ingrained and embedded in the way we go about things. So I just think we need to assume we're it and carry on. Mm. Well, I, I think on those words, um, I might hand back over to Flo. I think that's a really nice reflection. Um, thank you, Graham, And thank you for all our speakers and asking questions. As I said, there are lots of questions. Um, so we might try to pull some together and respond to some of the um, email that we'll be following up. Flo. Yeah, thank you so much, Tracy. And thank you so much to all of our wonderful speakers this evening. It's been such an informative and inspiring chat. And indeed, Graham, your words there are uh, inspiring ones to end on in terms of the fact that we're, we're already kind of embodying this intention to have a natural health service and actually policy follows movements so mm -hmm. um, it, that's a real kind of call to support and action for everyone um, that's on this call. Um, I think that um, just to close I wanted to share a few announcements um, about ways that you can get more involved as particularly with this uh, series of events that the Network of Wellbeing and Eden Project communities are running all around um, small steps, big difference, uh, nature connection and the change it can make in the world. Um, so uh, as one of um, my kind colleagues has kindly put, um, or will kindly put in the chat box, yeah. um, there's going to be some um, links coming into the chat box about future events um, that we're running in this series. Um, so we'll be running, it's a three event series, and then it's followed by a interactive workshop. So the idea is that you can, um, the events, uh, the three events will be speaker events that will be informative around different aspects of nature connection um, and nature connection and well-being. So the next one will be the nature of connection, how being outdoors supports community well being that will be held in two weeks time on Tuesday evening um, and that will be a really engaging opportunity to go a bit more deeper into that kind of community initiatives and, and community action aspect of nature connection um, and then uh, two weeks a fortnight after that we'll be looking at this kind of uh, more personal connection between nature and well-being. So that event will be called Playful, Mindful, Alive, How Nature Improves Your Well-Being. And that will be looking at um, 
a bit more deeply at these connections between our own mental health um, practices such as mindfulness in nature um, and yeah just kind of really digging into that topic in, a, in an engaging interactive way and then everyone that's been to any of these three events is welcome to join the follow-up workshop um, of the series um, which will be again in March two weeks after the next event that are, um, links will be are in the chat but also will be sent in the follow-up email and the workshop will be a space that will probably be a smaller group audience and will be held and supported to help embed some of the lessons that have been shared through this series into your lives into your communities into your uh, work and your practices so yeah we really want to take you guys um, those of you that would like to go on this journey with us um, of kind of exploring uh, nature and well-being now. And that is actually the hashtag for this series. So um, we'll be kind of sharing information and materials on social media in the for the duration of this series using using the hashtag nature and well-being now. Um, so really invite you to connect with us.